This morning, turn to the Gospel of John, Gospel of John, chapter number 14, Gospel of John, chapter 14, Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John, and we'll look at these few verses together. And once you find it, if we could please stand and respect and honor the reading of God's Word this morning, the Gospel of John, <coughs> excuse me, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Gospel of John, chapter number 14, and uh, we're going to begin reading in verse number 18 down through verse number 24. John chapter 14, beginning in verse number 18. The Bible, Jesus speaking here, he says, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. And that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. I want you to notice in verse number 21, the last part, uh, where the Bible says, um, and I will love him and will manifest myself <laughs> to him. I will manifest myself to him. Father, we do thank you for the word of God this morning. <clears throat> Father, I pray for the moments that we have together, you speak and encourage each and every heart. Lord, help our minds to be attentive to you. Lord, help us to realize you so much desire to make yourself real to us. And I pray, Lord, that we would want that uh, in our lives as well. And uh, we'd have a better understanding of how to do that this morning. And we'll thank you, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated, if you would, please, this morning. I love that phrase that I highlighted for us in the last part of verse number 15, where the Bible says, I will love him, I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. You know, it's easy to think of love just as an emotion, just as a feeling that we have, uh, and, and uh, sometimes we describe it sort of on Hallmark cards of how we try to describe the words of what love is all about, but love is much, much more than just a feeling or just an emotion. Uh, we see here that uh, when we think of love as an emotion, uh, we miss one of the key ingredients that love must not remain simply an emotion to be loved. There's got to be action. It has to manifest itself. It has to show uh, itself. Uh, to truly be loved, a husband's love for his wife is made manifest or made known uh, in the flowers that he brings her, in the words of encouragement that he says to her, and in him dying to himself and doing the chores and doing the providing for the, the things of the house and, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the expenses and things of that nature. A friend's love for a friend is made manifest by maybe picking up some medicine at the store for them uh, when they're sick or praying for them. Uh, when they're a little bit worried or a little anxious or concerned or uh, maybe playing a board game or something with them when they're alone and by themselves. And so it manifests itself. It shows itself. A parent uh, shows or manifests their love uh, to their children uh, when they're young and changing their diapers and making them meals and doing the laundry and teaching them to walk in the ways of God, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, and so all of those expressions of love are manifested or shown. And God wants to be able to show us how much he loves us. He says, I want to be able to manifest myself uh, to you. He says, I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And so love is much more than just an emotion. It must be manifest. Uh, as a part of speech, if we're looking at manifest as an adjective, uh, we see that manifest is, it modifies an object. The word manifest as a verb, though, is uh, something that means, uh, or by definition, means it's actual, uh, visible, realized, demonstrated, displaying, revealing, or showing, or to certify. It's to make something noticeable, to magnify, to uh, uh, manifest. It means to make something uh, evident. Uh, it's like a spotlight uh, where all the lights maybe go off in a room and, and uh, it highlights maybe a narrator, uh, narration of a story, a Christmas program that's given, and that spotlight zooms on 
uh, the, uh, the narration that's going to be uh, read. And it folks on that point. Now we can miss the brightness of the light itself because the light is not there to reflect and to show how bright its light is. It shows the focus point or what it wants to reveal as it reveals that which it shines itself upon. And so the job of that light, that floodlight, is not to call attention to itself. The job of that light is to reveal something, to illuminate something, to put on display something other than itself. And so God says, I want to be able to manifest myself to you. There's more than just living the Christian life of just looking forward to heaven one day. God wants us to walk with Him, but more than just walking with Him, God wants to be able to manifest, reveal, make Himself known to us in a very, in a very real and a very personal way. In 1 John chapter 3, the Bible says, verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And so God said, I don't want the love just to be a verbal, I love you. No, that's important. I think a husband needs to tell their, his wife, I love you. And a wife needs to tell her husband, I love you. Moms and dads, parents need to tell their children that I love you. And verbal expression of love is so important. But it can't just stop there. Uh, it's got to be a manifestation. It's got to be something that's beyond. It's shown the actions of our love beyond just saying and telling someone that we love them. You see, the proof that we know God's love is how we show that love to others. If you could take your Bibles for a moment and go to 1 John. Uh, we were in the Gospel of John a moment ago. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But go to 1 John, just before you get to Revelation, and uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verses number 7 and verse number 8. And so uh, God wants us to love people, but He wants us to show them that we love them. And uh, yes, tell someone you love them, but also show them by your effort, by the energies you put forth, and by your actions and things that you do for someone, that you love them. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, the Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. And so the proof that we know God's love is how we show that love to someone else. And so God said, if you say you love God, then, uh, then you ought to love others. And that love for others is action. It's manifested. It's something that you show to someone. Uh, often uh, uh, you can uh, bring a couple into a, a counseling session and you can ask the, the spouse, uh, do you feel loved uh, by uh, your spouse? And uh, the spouse that's doing the loving I would say, oh, that they, they, they know I love them. Uh, they know that they, they feel loved by me. But when you tell the, ask the spouse that's a recipient of that love, do you feel loved by your husband? Do you feel loved by your wife? Oftentimes, the expression is this, no, I don't. The response is this, I don't feel loved. I know they love me. And I, I know they, they, uh, they love me very dearly and sincerely, but I don't feel loved. Uh, they don't show that love. It doesn't connect uh, to my love language. It doesn't uh, connect to uh, knowing that I know they love me because I feel love. Now, is love a feeling? No, it's not. Uh, love is action. But when you're loving rightly, when you're loving someone the way they want to be loved, that love is going to produce a feeling. I'm going to feel love by my wife. I'm going to feel love by my mom and dad. I'm going to feel love uh, by, by my uh, uh, husband. I'm going to feel love uh, because I'm loving them action showing them manifesting that love so the response is i feel love uh, you know a question uh, that often can be asked uh in, in, a, in a very uh, non-threatening environment from a, in a husband or wife relationship is a uh, honey i know you know i love you but do you feel loved do you feel love and uh, what do i need to do to show you that i love you so that you can feel love knowing by the expression by, by the portraying of that love to you, that you feel love. Go to 1 John chapter 3. You're still in 1 John. <clears throat> Go to 1 John chapter 3. In verse number 1, the Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. 
And so the, the love that is, that's described uh, in the Bible, especially these two verses we looked at, cannot be described unless it's revealed. Uh, for example, for God so loved the world. That's a love that cannot be uh, just spoken. Uh, it has to be manifested, has to be revealed that what? For God so the world that he gave his only begotten son. He showed his love by giving of himself. He showed his love by the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And so the love described much throughout the Bible, uh, it cannot be described unless it's revealed. It has to be manifested. And so we need to know the difference, though, between the omnipresence of God and the manifest presence of God. Because those are two different uh, terminologies that we oftentimes put together. The omnipresent presence of God and the manifest presence of God that we're looking at uh, in the Gospel of John chapter number 14. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 23. Take your Bibles if you would and turn back there if, uh, if you would for just a, a few uh, moments. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 23 and look for verse, beginning at verse number 23. We see God's omnipresence. God's omnipresence. That means that God is always everywhere at any moment of time. There's never any time of any day that God is not presently there with us. He's omnipresent. Uh, he's not limited by space. He's not limited by time. I can't comprehend him. We can only be at one place at one time, focused on one thing at one time. But God is omnipresent. He's everywhere uh, as though you were the only person he could be with, but he's everywhere with each of us individually. Look what Jeremiah says of that in Jeremiah 23, verse 23. It says, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God far off? Can any man hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Saith the Lord, do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. And so here in these verses, we see the description of God's omnipresent presence. God is always present. There's never a time that he's not present. You can never escape the presence of God. That's why the Bible says nothing is ever hid from God. You can go and try to hide it from God. You can hide it from your mom and dad. You can hide it from your spouse. You can hide it from someone at work. But you cannot hide it from God. Why? He's in every place. Even the secret place of, that we would think are hidden from God. God is there. But we see in John chapter 14, it describes God's manifest presence. Where he says, I'm going to manifest myself to you. So we've got the omnipresence of God. God is everywhere at all times uh, concerning any and all of us. But then we have the manifest presence of God in John 14. One of the major, major differences between the omnipresence of God and the manifest presence of God is there's no condition placed upon the omnipresence of God. You don't have to do something for God to be there. Uh, you don't have to, to act in a certain way for God's presence to be there. Whether you're good or bad, right or wrong, it doesn't matter. God is always there, saved or lost, believer or unbeliever. God says, I'm omnipresent. I'm always at that location at that given time. Yet when God talks about the manifest presence of God, we see that the manifest presence of God has conditions placed upon it. If you want God to reveal himself to you, there's conditions that God placed upon us. The omnipresence of God, he's always there. But the manifest he said, that if you obey my commandments, uh, if you do what I tell you to do, in the verse, he says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he does that loveth me, he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will what? Manifest myself to him. So I don't just want to know God uh, in some distance, far away place. I want God to be real to us. I want God to be personal with us. I want God uh, to be close to us. And God wants that. That's why he says, I want to manifest. I want to make myself, reveal myself uh, to you in a very special and real way. And so, yes, God is everywhere present. But even though God is everywhere present, we're not always aware of his presence. And that's what the manifest presence of God is all about. You know, we can go through an entire life 
and uh, know that God is always there with us. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm always present with you. But we're never aware. We're never consciously aware of God's presence with us. We don't sense His presence with us. We know He's there because the Bible says He's there. We know He's there because He promises to be there. But we don't sense. Uh, we're, we're not able to sense the closeness of this presence that's manifested or made known unto us. This manifest presence of God. And so we see then that that's what God desires. And so to say that God is omnipresent is to say that God is present everywhere. But scripture also describes the manifest presence of God. God's omnipresence is an attribute of God being everywhere at one time. His omnipresence, uh, even when we're not aware of His presence, He's here, even if we don't recognize Him, even if we don't recognize His presence, but God's manifest presence is His presence made manifest. The fact that He is with us is made clear and obvious, and we know He's here, not because He tells us He's here, but because of His love for us, because of His our obedience to Him, in keeping the commandments, he said, I want to make myself manifest. I want to manifest myself so you know that I'm just not uh, a shepherd. I'm your shepherd. I'm not just God. I'm your God. I'm not just some greater power. I'm the God of your God. I'm your presence. I'm with you. I'm there close to you, the manifest presence of God. And so in other words, the Bible clearly teaches us that Jesus is always with us Matthew 28, I'll never leave that. Or, you know, lo, I'm with you always. But not every Christian perceives the presence of God. For example, this year, uh, you've had some times in your life, we've gone through some valleys. We all have. We've gone through some hard times, some trials. And we know because God says, I'm there, we know He's there. And by faith, we trust that He's there because He says He's there. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be there with you. And so by faith, we know He's there. But we go through the journey in this life, through some of these hard times, and we just don't sense His presence. Uh, his presence is not made manifest to us. Now, we know He's there, but He's not been manifest or it's not obvious to us that He's there. So, for example, salvation is a personal manifestation of God in your life. If you've been saved, that was a personal manifestation that God had with you. And sad to say, for most Christians, the only manifestation that God's ever had in your life is a day you got saved. And since then, you've not allowed Him to manifest Himself. It doesn't mean He's not there. It doesn't mean He's not present. But you've not been aware and sensitive and alert to the Prince of God in that manifest way. And so God manifests Himself to us in salvation. How to do that? He brought about conviction of sin. He made us realize we're a sinner. And because of that conviction of sin, we were in need of a Savior. And there's that personal knowledge of God saying, because of your sin, you deserve hell. But God says, I've made a way possible. You can be forgiven of your sin. And He manifests Himself to us. And we called upon the Lord. We got saved at that moment of time. He made Himself real to us. We called upon Him as our Savior to forgive us of our sins, to give us a home in heaven. And sad to say, as I said a moment ago, that oftentimes is the only time in an entire Christian's life that he's ever been able to manifest himself to us. He's omnipresent. He's always there. He's ever present with us. The promise of God saying, I'll never leave you. I'll always be there. But we don't sense. It's like what Job said. I looked on the, the left and he wasn't there. And I looked on the right, and he wasn't there. And I looked in front and behind. He wasn't there. Was God there? Sure he was. But he was saying, I can't sense his presence. I can't just sense that God is close and that God's real and God's with me through this hard time. It feels like I'm just going through this journey of hardship all by myself, alone, and uh, without God's presence with me. And so every salvation experience involves God manifesting himself to each of us individually. The Last Supper is a setting for John 14. Knowing that he's about to be crucified the next day, Jesus promised that he continue to manifest himself 
to the followers through the promise of the coming comforter. He promised, I'm going to send what? The comforter is going to come. Holy Spirit's going to come. And the job of the Holy Spirit will be to manifest, to make real, uh, to, to be able to sense the presence of God with you. God doesn't just want you to go through life and know that God's there because He says He's there. God says, I want you to sense my presence. And we can look back maybe at some time in your life during a real low time, real hard time, real sorrowful time, a real grieving time, and you could just sense the presence of God uh, with you. You knew God was there holding you and caring for you and nurturing you. And God's grace was sufficient during that time. It was a rough time. It was a hard time. But you could sense more than ever God's presence. It's like sometimes you read your Bible. And reading the Word of God, uh, sometimes you just read the Bible and it's just words coming off the page. But then there's other times. And you've read the Bible and it's like, wow, God is just manifesting himself and he's revealing a part of who he is to you uh, that you need at that time of your life, the struggles you're going through that moment of your time of your life. And he reveals himself, he manifests himself through the word of God. And it's like he's just there reading the pages of the word of God to you versus you reading it yourself as he manifests himself to us. And so we see then that our greatest spiritual need beyond the omnipresence of God is the manifest presence of God uh, in our lives. See, in the Old Testament, the high priest could only go once a year in the Holy of Holies and the presence of God, the manifest presence of God, and intercede on behalf of the people of God and bring an animal sacrifice. The blood was shed, and that would bring an atonement for the people's sin. We see in Hebrews 4, 16, that God wants us today, though, on the new covenant, to come boldly on the throne of God. And so God manifests His presence, uh, in His presence revealed to us in a very tangible and real way. That's why I love this verse. Take your Bibles and go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 15. Gospel of Mark chapter 15, this explains a little bit about what, what Hebrews talks about when God said, I want you to go boldly in the throne of, of, of God's presence, in the throne of grace. And, and so the omnipresence of God is God is everywhere. But the manifest presence of God is this, God is here with me at this moment of time. At this trial that I'm going through, at this obstacle I'm facing, He's here right now with me and you know it beyond just because God says it but you sense his presence in a special way look at Mark chapter 15 <clears throat> excuse me verse number 37 and verse number 38 Jesus cried with a loud voice here he is on the cross and uh, just uh, a short time he'll be um, uh, taken from the cross and buried in resurrection a few days later and it says and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost he died and the veil of the temple, verse 38, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. What had happened here? This was the veil, the curtain. And it wasn't just a curtain that we would think about that just sort of a, a, that flows in the wind. Real, just one a single layer of, of fabric. But this curtain was very thick. And it was the barrier between the, the holy uh, place and the holy of holies, the very dwelling place of God there within the tabernacle. And uh, where God's presence uh, was there a part of the holy of holies. And the holy of holies was a place where God, uh, His tangible presence, dwelt in the temple. And when Jesus died on the cross, that veil, that thick curtain was torn asunder from the top to the bottom. Why? Because now the ultimate sacrifice had been done. No more animal sacrifice had to be done for an atonement for sin. The high priest no longer was the intercessory between God and man at that moment to intercede on behalf of the people. Now Jesus, our high priest, stood before God as the chief intercessor. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And the temple veil, the veil in the holy void was ripped asunder from top to the bottom. Why? From top to bottom. Because God was initiating the tear. Uh, God's justice was satisfied. And uh, sin's price had been paid. Uh, the Savior had suffered our hell on that cross. And now no longer was there need for a high priest to go on, be on our behalf. Now we had access in the Holy of Holies. 
any moment of any hour, any day, any time. You could go any place. It wasn't a church location. It could be in your car. It could be along a river somewhere. It could be in your bedroom. It could be in a workroom at your office. Anywhere at any time. You and I have access to God. We can go in to the holy of holies of God's presence. That's what we talk about in Hebrews where he says to boldly, Hebrews 4.16, to boldly come before the throne of God uh, in his presence. And so we're talking about now we can have the manifest presence of God in our life. Not just the omnipresence, presence of God, but the manifest, the unveiled, the revealed uh, the, the visible, the, the, the tangible, uh, the, the visible presence of God in our life. Not where God comes into a room and, and we see a, a facade of, of God, but where God's presence is sensed in your life like no other time because you can see God manifesting himself uh, to us. Uh, you see, that's what Moses uh, wanted uh, when he said uh, about uh, uh, the manifest presence of God. In Exodus 33, 15, he said, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Uh, talking about going to the promised land. Moses said, I'd rather be in the wilderness with God's presence than in a promised land. And God, your presence is not manifest. I want to know that you're there. I want to know that I'm in the center of your will. I want to know I'm doing the right thing. And that manifest presence of God. Moses said, I'd rather stay back and not go forward because I want to make sure that God, your presence is there. And so that veil uh, was torn asunder. And as soon as Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn from top to bottom that gives us, gives you and I, entrance into heaven. Take your Bibles. Go to Hebrews chapter number 10. See, I don't have to go through a pastor to get to God. I don't have to go through a priest to get to God. Uh, there's one mediator, as I said a moment ago, uh, between God and man. That's the man, Christ Jesus. The only mediator that we need between us and God is the Lord Jesus Christ. But look in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, as we look at the promise that God gives us about this new um, presence of God that we have, we have access to, that we never had access to before until the crucifixion of our Savior. Hebrews chapter 10, look what it says, beginning in verse, verse number 19. It says, having therefore, brethren, what? Boldness, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. He said, listen, we can get God to God now. We don't have to go through the high priest once a year because of the blood of Christ we can get there. That is to say, his flesh, verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And so what he says, we have a high priest. And how do we have access now? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. So I don't get to God because I'm a Baptist. I don't get to God because I'm a Catholic, because I'm a good person, because I was confirmed, because I was baptized. I get to God one way, and that's through the blood that was shed by our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God that takes away, amen, the sins of, our, of the world and takes away the punishment of our sin and death and hell. And the grave was conquered uh, as a result of death and the burial and the resurrection of our Savior. And so we see that we now have access to God because of the cross. We can see and uh, be able to enjoy the manifest presence of God. So here's what it is. What is then the manifest presence of God? Here it is. It's having a God consciousness as you live life. It's a God awareness as you live life. It's a God consciousness as you go through life. Uh, you see, the fall of man had a profound separation from the presence of God. Man lost his God consciousness and became self-conscious. All he was worried about was what? Himself. What's in it for me? What can I benefit? How can I, you know, what's going to be good in my favor? The God consciousness of man because of sin was gone. And so now God says, I want to be able to manifest myself to you. If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. 
And God says, I love when you keep my commandments because that allows me, you've met the condition to where now I can begin to manifest myself, make myself, reveal myself. Uh, uh, so you can sense my prince with you. You'll be able to recognize the prince of God with you. There's a God consciousness about you. God consciousness is a constant awareness of God's divine presence throughout the various activities of any given day in our daily life. The more of the word of God that we take in and that we live out in obedience, the more of God he'll manifest himself to us. And so how does he do that? He manifests himself primarily through the word of God. Because this is the living manifestation of the word of God. Uh, God with what? Emmanuel. God with us. And, and so God uh, tabernacled among us, dwelt among us, and has given to us his living word that will manifest and reveal who he is to us. And so we can begin to see God in ways that we never saw him before. Because it's not, not how shall they hear without a preacher. And uh, how'd you get saved? Someone took the word of God and the word of God manifested the sinfulness in your life. The word of God manifested uh, this need of a Savior. The word of God manifested there is no other way of salvation but through Jesus Christ. And it was manifested and made known to you. And you said, yes, I want Jesus to be my Savior. And so we see then that the more I obey, the more I apply, take in and live out the word of God, then the more God will manifest his presence uh, in our lives. Jesus is a living word. As we love and honor the written word, Jesus will honor us with his presence. The more we love Jesus and worship him, he'll manifest himself to us. See, God doesn't just want to be a distant God in universe somewhere, in heaven somewhere. God says, I want to be, the Lord is, he's my shepherd. Now, why was David, David able to say that? Well, the Lord's our shepherd, the Lord's the shepherd. Well, that's true, he is the shepherd, but he says, the Lord's my shepherd. Why? Because he had had a manifestation. God had made himself known to David in a very real way, a very special way. He knew that God was with him. He knew the presence of God was there with him. He knew the omnipresence of God is always there. But he says, I know God's here at this moment, at this time, right now, what I'm going through. I can sense the presence of God with me. Take your Bibles go to Daniel chapter number 3. We even see this with the pagan King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, king Nebuchadnezzar was unaware of God's omnipresence. And uh, so he threw the three uh, children, the Hebrew children, in the burning fiery furnace, Daniel chapter 3. And it seemed for a time uh, that God seemed uh, uh, forsaken Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Seemed like they were all by themselves. They're there to stand for God, and God forsook them. And it seemed like God left them, and now they're thrown in this fiery furnace, forsaken by God, it seemed. But look in Daniel chapter 3, verse 24. The Bible says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished. He was astonished, amazed, marveled, and rose up in haste, and spoke and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. You see, the reality of God's presence became discernible. Even to the pagan king that was there, God's manifest presence. We'll never lose God's presence in reality. But we can lose the sense of his presence as we go through life. There may be some of us here today saying, you know, I know God's with me because he says he is. He's on the presence. I understand that doctrine, that attribute. I know the promise. He said, I'll never leave you all for sake. I know those promises in the Bible. I know he's always with me. But preacher, I'm really having a hard time sensing his presence with me. I don't sense the closeness of God with me. I don't sense the, the nearness of God with me. And uh, God wants to manifest himself to us. But it's conditioned upon us obeying him. If you love me, he says, you'll keep my commandments. And the degree that you and I obey him is a degree that God is able then to manifest or make real himself to us. There's never a time when God is not present with us. But there are some times when God is not manifestly with us. 
Sometimes his presence is clear and obvious, and we can sense as we read the Bible. You get down and spend time in prayer. It's like, man, I, I can sense God with me, and I can sense the power of God in my life. I can sense the nearness of God with me as I'm praying. And there's other times you pray, and it seems like he's miles away. You sit down and read your Bible, it seems like he's right there. And boy, you're gleaning truths from the Word of God, and things are just coming out of his Word. And other times you're just reading one chapter after another chapter. And it just seems like nothing is hitting home. Going through a hard time, and boy, it seems you can sense God with you. And you go with a confidence. There's a calmness of heart, a peace of passive all understanding. It's a rough road. It's a hard road. It's a difficult road. But there's a calmness in your spirit. There's a peace of God with you. And other times, you're anxious. You're fearful. You're stressed. You're worried. You know he's there. But he's not manifesting his presence omniscient or on the presence you know he's there but you don't sense the nearness of that presence and so all, all even though God is present <clears throat> everywhere his manifest presence is when we realize his presence you know nature itself proves there's a God but do you see the presence of God in nature itself, proving the power and the magnificence and the splendor. The lost can look to nature and says, there's got to be something more than us. Everything God does in your life, if you have a God consciousness, you'll see God at work through the good and through the bad. Something doesn't go your way, you don't get the job promotion, you get laid off, you get cut back on some hours, something doesn't work out the way you want it to go. And if you have a God consciousness, you're going to say, God, thank you for closing that door. Because, God, I know you're sparing me from something. I know, God, you're helping me in some area of my life. I don't see it. I don't understand it. But I can sense your presence and you're working. And there's that God conscience that you have. And you know that God's there with you. Got it. The steps, what? Of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Every step of a man is ordered by God. And God says, I want to guide your step. I want you to sense my presence. Every step of your life, I want you to know that I'm there. A God awareness. A God consciousness. A God of focus that you have. And so God is always with us uh, on the present. But his presence is not always a manifest presence. Not because God's not manifesting himself, but our perception of God is not there. Because we're so focused on things that are not going the way in our life that we're missing it. We're missing it. That's what the Bible says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Why does God say, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to me? If God is omnipresent, and if God's always with us, but in James chapter 4, verse 8, he says, draw nigh to God. Come close to God, and I'll come close to you. Well, isn't that a contradiction? God's always with us? No. Well, what he's saying here in James 4, uh, we, don't, we don't ask God to draw, draw near to someone who's already and always is near. Rather, we're asking for what? A growth in awareness of recognizing the nearness of God because as we draw near to God, I want to be able to be aware of God's nearness in my life. I want to walk in such a way that I can sense the closeness of God. He's my shepherd. He's not just the shepherd. He's the one that gives me a peace to pass the understanding. Not just some God in the universe, but he's my God. He's my Lord. He's my shepherd. He's my Savior. As you go through life, God said, I want to manifest myself so that you're not going through life saying, well, your God does that for you. No, he's my God. He's your God and your shepherd. My God and my shepherd. Draw nigh to God. God said, I want you to have an awareness, a God consciousness of a, the divine presence. Listen, if God is always with us, and he is on the present, then why is he not always able to manifest his presence? It's not because he doesn't want to. He said, I want to manifest myself to you. But do you want God? To manifest himself to you. And where's that come? It's a condition. He says, if you keep my commandments. And so the more you take the word of God in and you live it outwardly in your life, then God said, I'm going to be able to make myself more real to you. And so now it becomes this wonderful uh, 
growth process that we go through as we learn more of the Bible to apply it. And the more we apply it, then God reveals himself to us and manifests himself to us as a light makes, makes shine and makes manifest. Uh, the light's not the special. It's making known and manifesting. God said, I want to manifest what? Myself to you. I want you to say you've got a great God, an all-powerful God. No need to worry and no need to be overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. I'm a God that can comfort you and strengthen you. I want to manifest myself to you. So I'm a real God. A God that will help you through the trials of life. They'll help you through the burdens you have to bear. They'll help you through the hardships you have to face in life. I want to be that close God. I want to manifest myself to you more than just when you got saved. I want to be able to manifest myself day in and day out. And so God's presence is promised for us as believers and unbelievers alike because of his omnipresent. But as the believer, he believes and expects God to be with him. He is much more likely to experience God's manifest presence because you say, I know God's here. Why? By faith, I know he's here. But God, I want to know that you're here with me now at this moment. I know you're with Daniel. I know you're Shadrach and Meshach. I know you're with Moses. I know you're with David. I know you're with Noah. I know you're with Jonah. I know you're with all these. But I want to know that you're with me at this moment of my life. And you sense, and so as you read the Bible, God is able to manifest himself to you, and the word of God comes alive. It's like, wow, I read that verse dozens of times and never got that out of it before. What happened? God has manifested himself to you through his word. You're spending time in prayer, and you pray, and say, man, I've never felt the closeness of God that I've felt. I've never sensed the closeness of God as I was there, and I just prayed and prayed, and 10 minutes turned into an hour, and it just seemed like the time went so quick, and it was like God was there with me. We know he's always there, but he's manifesting that presence with us. As you go through the hardships and trials of life, sometimes we have to go by faith. And we know he's there because he says he's there. And sometimes by divine plan, he withdraws himself, not because he's not present, but that we don't sense his presence. Because he wants and says, the just shall walk by faith and not by sight. I want you to know that I'm there because I said I'm there. And he says, when you know I'm there because I said I'm there, then you're trusting me. And when you trust me and obey me, he says, then I can make and manifest, and then you can know that I'm there. And it may be as simple as someone sending you a little text. It may be as simple as someone uh, calling you. It may be as simple as the doctor coming in with a certain type of report. It may be as, whatever it might be. It just may be simple where God just manifests himself to you. Uh, for some, I know uh, some of them, to, to, to sort of a, a reminder that, that God, we know that God loves us. But sometimes you might say, you know, God, if I can see a falling star, every time I see a falling star, that's just your way of saying I love you. It's you manifesting you, to you to me that you love me. And sometimes you'll be out and about and out of the clear, but without even expecting it. You're going through a hard time. You think you're all alone, and you see flash of the sky, that, that falling star. And then that reminds you and says, God, thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me manifesting yourself. That's what the rainbow is supposed to be. And you see the beauty of the rainbow. Uh, the, the sodomites and homosexuals, they've tried to rob that great promise of God uh, that God's given us to manifest what? His promise, I'll never destroy the world again by water, by a flood. And that rainbow is a man. So when you see that, it should be a manifestation of God's love for you. Manifestation. As you walk out and see the sunrise and the sunset, a manifestation of God's love, the beauty of God's creation, a manifestation of God's goodness in your life. All the while, just God revealing and saying, God, draw an eye to God. I'll draw an eye to you. What's that drawing out of God? I want to have a more aware, God conscious. I want to have a more God consciousness of your presence with me, God, throughout life, every step I take. I want to recognize your presence with me, knowing there's no accidents, there's no coincidence, there's no oh's, there's no luck, there's no happenstance. Everything is divinely ordained of God. I want to be God conscious as I go through life, aware that God is with you every step of your life. It'll, it transforms the way you look at life. You don't feel sorry for yourself when things don't go the way you want it. When you have a God conscious, you're going to say, thank you, God, in everything. Give thanks. How can you give thanks to the hard times? Because you have a God conscious knowing, God, you always do what's best for me. 
And if this didn't come to pass, then you must know this isn't best for me. And so, God, I trust you. I thank you. And in everything I give thanks, there's that God consciousness that we have of God. Father,